and welcome to the um, Art History Society Spring Symposium Series, Art in Our Lives. It's a bi-weekly video lecture series scheduled every other Thursday until the end of the spring semester, but a summer series might happen. Make sure to keep an eye out for that. Um, the theme of the series is to tell you the many ways you can be a part of the art world from educators to creators. We hope to highlight these professional experiences in order to inspire and instigate the opportunities and capabilities um, that exists in the art world. Make sure to keep your video off and your microphones muted, please. And you can type your questions out in the chat and we will ask, um, have the questions asked after the lecture and it'll be around a 15 to 20 minute Q&A. And today we have the beautiful, illustrious, wonderful, um, intelligent and kind Gabriel Avilar. And we are so pleased to have him with us. He's one of our own Art History Society members. He is our secretary. And I am so excited to hear everything that he has to say about his journey in the art world. So with that, take it away, Gabriel. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to tell everyone, thank you for uh, showing up and uh, for allowing the Art History Society to continue the advocacy of pr providing art into the lives of so many of us who are affected uh, and inspired by it. So I just wanna say thank you uh, for giving me that opportunity. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, I wanna be able to say thank you to a couple of people before we do, even though they're mentioned after. I do wanna say to all of my uh, professors that I can see logging on, I, I, I am beyond floored right now, but I have to keep it together. So um, I just wanna say, you shall receive my, my personal thank yous uh, else uh, later on. Uh, and everyone who has contributed, everyone who has contributed, uh, definitely know that um, I am here because of you. So, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the one obligatory thank you that I must give is to my advisor, uh, El Gran Profet Lamatini, Mr. Manuel Aguilar, because he is the one that's guiding me now. He decided to take on me and I don't know why, but he, I guess he, he, he was just not, you know, informed enough about how cruel it is to have me by, as a student, but I shall Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Gracias a ti. Um, okay, so I'm yes. Let me do that again. Just because I can go to grad school doesn't mean I know how to use a computer. Okay, and is everyone able to see the screen? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm gonna get started really quickly. Um I, I guarantee it'll be fast, but uh, it's gonna be uh, a whole world of um, dimensions. So uh, please be ready to laugh, cry, and pass out, I don't know, uh, we'll see. Uh, so, uh, should have done it before. Uh, maybe I do need to go back. All right, here we go. So this is called Art in Our Lives, The Resilience of Students, AKA me. Now the purpose of this lecture is to give all those other students, whether they be grad students or undergrad students, um, another vision of what it's like to go into higher academia, uh, to, to realize the power that you have within yourselves to make a difference in this world, to make it, to leave it better than you found it. And so with my small, uh, and uh, very, very um, inopportune life. I hope that I can give you some inspiration or some guidance as to what to do right or maybe what not to do. All bets are off. So let's start off with my journey from San Luis Potosí all the way to East LA. Um, I, start, I was born in San Luis Potosí and I had the pleasure of being raised by positive, strong women who made such an inflection in my life that I carried it all throughout my tenure as a student. I remember when I was five years old, 
uh, you see that here, getting ready for um, kindergarten, the teacher said, when you come into the classroom, take whatever, take whatever table you want, whatever desk you want. Um, when she came back from having all the students in, she found me in the teacher's desk. So that was a premonition, I, I believe. Um, of course, I went through the uh, regular uh, school process in elementary in, in Mexico. And upon turning 10, I turned, I came to the United States as an undocumented student. And I graduated uh, a year early because of my own advanced uh, inclinations towards mathematics, writing, and creative processes. Um, so um, here I am, getting, you know, picking my my um, my costume or my my attire the day before on a two dollar budget that uh, my parents uh, had to get for me because we always grew up in a very poor community uh, or from a very poor family. Uh, this is my aunt. This is my grandmother, and this is my mother. These are the women that have always been influential in how I how I live and how I think and how I want to produce and how I want to be a better person. So I uh, went through junior high, you know, the awkward, the obviously awkward, uh, you know, situations of not being fully acculturated to America, but also being different, uh, meaning that at that point I realized that I was not uh, uh, in a normative, uh, what we would say, behavior. I, I understood that I was growing up uh, and that I had been born gay. Uh, and so that took a toll on me because I fought with myself. And that was a whammy that I had to fight often uh, from childhood on. And uh, that was uh, one of the things that started to get me this idea of you need to toughen up your skin, be tougher, you know? Um, in high school, I uh, did the same thing. I, I struggled a lot because I struggled with being an undocumented immigrant. I struggled with being uh, a, a gay undocumented immigrant. I struggled with being a poor gay undocumented immigrant. And uh, this really kind of took a toll on, on me, uh, especially when I found out that uh, in 1995, you know, through life, college, and uncertainties, um, there were no laws that were enabled then for undocumented students to register for college. Although I must mention that I was in the top 10 students out of 800 graduating from the Hollywood High Performing Arts Center in, in the heart of Hollywood, um, top eight students. And um, I had more scholarships than any other students, however, uh, all that was not able to be sent to the colleges because I didn't apply, because I didn't know that I could do, that I would pursue a higher education. So that, that hunger for knowledge started from before, but in 95, it took on its own. So in around 2003, 2004, we started seeing this AB 540, which was the, the, the ability, the legality to, uh, bring uh, students who were undocumented. At that point, they weren't called dreamers yet. They were the prototypes of the dreamers. And uh, it gave me hope. And I started uh, thinking about what could I do? What should I do? I wanted to do so many things at that point. I knew that I was into art. I knew that I was into um, uh, fashion. I knew that I was into dance. I knew that I was into history. I just didn't know what I could do with it. Um, so as any student uh, familiar with familialism, which is the idea that you don't go to college, but you work uh, to, um, uh, to make a living to help your parents, um, that's just what you do. So I worked for uh, 10 years. And in 2005, I took a chance. I did something. I should not have done, but then I should have because I wouldn't be here. I decided to 
enroll at Santa Monica College. How did I get into Santa Monica College without having an ID? I don't know. It must have been serendipity or somebody just looking down on me. Um, you know, at this point, I had thought about the idea that my grandmother had been gone for 10 years and having been the wisest woman I'd ever known with her, uh, tla, 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 uh, I can't even say it, with her dichos, um, where with Tlatoli is what dichos are. Um, I just thought, you know, just go for it. Uh, but just, you know, just because I was interested didn't mean that I was qualified as my lovely advisor, Dr. Paquette would say in Long Beach. Um, I spent five years on and off taking classes that, you know, I am sure a lot of community college students have gone through this. Um, I took one class, I liked it, I passed it. I took another class, I didn't like it, I dropped it, I withdrew, I failed, I retook it. And I spent a long time with it. Um, and it was under the incredible um, rebozo of my incredible fairy godmother, Miss Judy, Miss Douglas, Judy Douglas, because I can't even call her Judy. Um, you know, she said, you know, you need to, you're, you have a lot of passion but you need to get the work, get to work. Otherwise, you're always gonna be doing this and none of what you say is gonna matter unless you start building on that passion. So um, many seasons of hope and, and, and budgeting, having to work with different jobs and different uh, schedules really changed my trajectory. Um, in 2010, I did go through the most tragic year I could ever experience, uh, and that we'll get into later. Um, uh, I wanna forward to 2015 when after 20 years, I was able to, I was accepted into Cal State Long Beach and I um, decided to really pursue my work and really be over the, the hill and, and enjoy my my, my work and my, like my real core classes. Um, I wanna fly back to 2010 though. I had at that point, um, I had one, I was like, what do I really wanna do? Is there something that I could do? And having established myself as a dancer first, I, I was really into a choreographer called Twyla Tharp. And Twyla Tharp, got a degree in art and then a master's in art history. And I thought, well, I could do the same, uh, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to do art history. I was like, oh, I don't know, looking at old paintings and having to talk about them. It's not really my thing, even though I love doing it. I was just psycho, um, being psychosomatic. So um, for my birthday, I decided to go to this exhibition that they were having at LACMA and it was a, an exhibition about Olmecs. And I walked in, of course, mind you, not having ever seen real Mexican Mesoamerican art and seeing it for the first time in a, in a foreign country, seeing my own art, my ancestors, it just floored me. And I walked out, I sat, on one of the benches, I cried for a couple of minutes. Um, and then I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. Uh, of course, this was uh, encouraged by the incredible uh, tenacity of my professor, Professor Walter Meyer at Santa Monica College, who really encouraged me and was like, you know, let's do it, let's do it. So again, then I go back to Long Beach in 2015 and I meet uh, Dr. Elizabeth Aguilera uh, and Dr. Katha Paquette, who between the two molded me and really shaped me. Whereas Dr. Aguilera was like, you know, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be looking at. Uh, this is how I did it. And if I could do it, you could do it. Um, and Dr. Paquette was like, the, you know, it was good cop, bad cop. And I am forever thankful to them, to them too for that. Um, so, uh, I graduated in 2017 uh, with honors and it was great. Um, I thought I was going to continue my project and, and continue a master's program because I really was uh, uh, told by my teachers, 
you know, you should think about a master's program. And I just thought, you know, going back to that idea of familialism, just work, make money. Why do you need to go to school? And um, of course, then something really incredible happened, both tragic and uh, incredible in 2018. And I'll give you just one, one clue. It's called Cuatlique. Um, and that led me to what is now I call in 2019, where hope is finally alive. So before I continue on to the, to the great work that was uh, instilled in me, um, I, I do want to talk about this because I feel that this is important for students to know that you're not going to have an easy path and that not every um, career is from point A to point B. Um, you know, I had food insecurities, I had transportation insecurities, I had study habits, and I had work. Um, it was what I call ain't no shame. I would often hang out um, where the affluent college kids were and where they would eat because I knew that they would only eat half of their meals. So they threw their meal out, guess what? It's my lunch today. And that's what got me through, through a lot of days at Santa Monica College and through um, Cal State Long Beach. Um, every semester I had, a, a, it was kind of like a, a running joke of, what what's the what's the the menu of this of the semester now? Uh, one semester it was dollar burritos. Another semester was fifty nine cent taco uh, potato tacos. Uh, another semester it was two dollar special dollar fries because I had to make ends meet and I had to pay rent. I had to pay you know my bus. I had to pay um, uh, my utilities and you know. Between that and everything else, I was left with three, four dollars to my name every day. Um, so of course, I volunteered everywhere where they offered food. I'm sure there's been other students who do that, and I'm sure there will be others after. I think that should be like a continuous process, no matter what. Even if they're not volunteering, there should be something. Uh, food insecurity is very real, and I feel that that's really important to highlight for our students today. Um, sometimes in order to get to school, I'd have to wake up at five in the morning, take a three hour trip to three different bus systems from North Hollywood to Santa Monica, from North Hollywood to Long Beach, from East LA to Long Beach, from Van Nuys to Cal State LA. Um, there were a lot of uh, times when I spent more time on the bus than I actually did at home. And this was tough. This was tough because I missed a lot of opportunities to be with family. I missed a lot of opportunities to be with friends. I missed a lot of opportunities to actually engage myself deeper in my, in my curriculum, in my studies. So every day was a choice. Do I use the little money that I have and use it for food? Or do I walk home for four hours? Which is it gonna be? Bus time was study time or sleepy time or cry time, depending on the day. Scheduling was a full-time job. If you knew me, you knew I had three jobs. You knew I had to juggle with being a housekeeper, a coffee shop uh, manager, retail, um, massage therapy, yoga instructor, you name it, I did it. It's what we call in Spanish, el mil usos. So. Uh, and not ashamed of it at all. But, you know, I have to say that through all my struggles, I really found myself with saviors. And these were my teachers, my mentors, my colleagues, and all those life lessons. Through it all, I had incredible sources of support. Of course, you already know them. My fairy godmothers, that's what I call them uh, without, their, without them knowing. But that's who they are to me because they just, that feeling. Uh, my career counselors, um, I can think of Patty Del Valle and Maria Martinez who would, you know, me jalaban las orejas. They would, you know, clip my ears and be like, come on, get to, get to work. You're such a good student, you can do it. I wasn't aware that my own complexes and my own uh, complexities were what was, making me 
take two steps forward and take two steps back. You know, they also, everyone saw a need to reel that passion in from becoming self-destructive or counterproductive because God knows I could. These saviors were my strength when I needed them most, especially when life lessons came beyond my control. I call these life lessons uh, the tragedies. In 2010, tragedy struck our lives when my two nieces were struck by a distracted driver. My goddaughter, Emily, perished, and my other niece, Angela, became quadriplegic and has been ever since. I was dealing with depression from my, uh, from my uncle's death the previous year, also being laid off from work and having lost my uh, dog. So I dropped into depression with alcohol and I was drinking two bottles a day to numb me. And this continued for a year and a half. Um, thanks to some wonderful angels, I was able to leave that part of my life behind. In 2018, I was diagnosed with a lifetime condition that placed me in the hospital for a period of two weeks. The main doctor said to me flatly that I had not, if I had not gotten there when I did, I would not have made it past that day. And that was another, these tragedies really made me realize how incredibly lucky I am to be a part of this world right now today and to make a difference. And if I don't, how dare I? share the same floor with all of my distinguished guests and all of my incredible advisors and all of my marvelous friends and colleagues. So this led to triumphs. Um, I did graduate from Santa Monica College with honors. I, uh, I was awarded the Simon Trust Scholarship. I graduated from CSULB with honors. Uh, um, in 2017, excuse me, that's a typo. Uh, but I did uh, uh, get the Edith Mako Art History Scholarship Award. Um, I was also given uh, a very special recognition, which was to be the commencement of the flag, the banner holder for the entire College of the Arts at Cal State Long Beach, which is usually reserved for graduate students who are culminating their, their program. Um, and as an undergrad, I was chosen uh, and this was an incredible, incredible honor that I will always be thankful to Dr. Paquette and uh, the Dean Cyrus Jeanette Parker uh, for giving me that opportunity to, to shine a little bit. Um, so after my, my um, one of my tragedies, I, this is where Cuatlico comes in. I, was doing, I, I work with a particular festival that deals with Dia de Muertos. And that year they decided to do a program dedicated to Cuatlicue, Mother of the Gods. Now, mind you, I had been already exposed to the Olmec exhibition and also the Golden Kingdoms uh, later on a couple of years later at the Getty. Um, but I had never really taken that much interest in it. And so I thought, you know what what is this let me do some research so i went on youtube and i typed in you know this person and see what you know and they were doing they showed this uh video of them doing consultation with dr manuel aguilar and he started talking about it and i thought oh that's really cool um and so i thought you know maybe this is an opportunity for me to like get to that go to the next level right so uh, i did talk to my advisor um she did tell me she did say to me Manuel is amazing. You're gonna love him. He's incredible, uh, but your writing is horrible. You need to get better at it. And mind you, I always mention it, and I know Dr. Paquette doesn't like me saying it as much, but I say it because it was something that really made me change my, my reflection of who I thought I was and who I needed to be. Um, so I will always be indebted to Dr. Paquette for that particular. Um, Jalón de Orejas, once again. Because of it, I was accepted to the graduate program at Cal State LA for the fall of 2019. And I became, once again, the studious child under the great auspices of Dr. Manuel Aguilar. 
Um, throughout it, I've maintained uh, 4.0. Let me remind you, in 20, between 20, 2005 and 2010, I couldn't even get a, a, a 2.0 average. It was not in the cards. So now that we've gotten over the, uh, the, the melodrama, the telenovelas part of my life, now we can talk about where we are in my, uh, in my work. So my concentration is going to be on female figures in the history of Mexico, from Mesoamerican cultures to contemporary society. My goal is to make an impact or to create dialogue about the importance of giving these many forgotten powerful figures their place in history. Mind you, it is not just to say, uh, let's rewrite it, but let's combine it or let's, let's restructure it so that we are able to, for every time we mention Pancho Villa, we also mention, you know, La Adelita. For every time we mention Moctezuma, we also mention Malintzin or Tequichpo, uh, you know. So that's the idea for me, that, that's what's my impetus. And the outcome should be a self-awareness that is enhanced by looking at the educational material and other academic paraphernalia, which engage all women to feel that they are part of that conversation with regards to the status quo in Mexico and in the world. One of the things I love to ask people all the time is I say, can you think of um, two famous historical figures from Mexico? And the first thing we always get is, oh yes, Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, right? And if there's that occasional other historical figure, um, we get Frida. But you know, all, all respects to my one of my muses, there's more to the world than just Frida. There's more to the Mexican art world than just Frida and, and or Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. So my other interests as well though, um, codices, um, the cult of death, because what self-respecting Mexican wouldn't be self-respecting Mexican if they didn't have an appreciation for the cult of death, right? Um, but also contemporary approaches to Mesoamerican interpretation. And this is really great because I've been able to um, really work well with my cohort. We all have different ideas about what we want to approach, but we all support each other because there's a lot of interconnectivities that we recognize and therefore it makes our web stronger in terms of output. So for example, like I said, there's the great and grand Cuatlique. So Mesoamerican female deities, the role of Mesoamerican women before, during, and after the conquest of Mexico Tenochtitlan. And of course this, their function in society and how pervasive those roles have remained throughout our continuum because you know, what has been done before was done then, is being done now, will probably still be done later, but I feel like there, that there needs to be a connection of understanding, you know, um, in, in the, for the, just for the sake of example, the, the myth of Cuatlicue giving birth to Huitzilopochtli was that she was on Cuatepec, you know, the, the hill of snakes, and she was, uh, she was, um, using a broom or she was, estaba, estaba, um, I can't think of the word now because I'm so flustered. Estaba barriendo, you know, she was uh, cleaning the floor or cleaning the temple in Cuatepec as a source of penitence. We know that we do that now in cultural society in our, in the status quo now, because when you want to have a limpia, you go and they put all this stuff all over you and it's, it's, as a, it's as a form of penitence, but it's also as a form of uh, revival, right? Or, or, or recontinuing that, that myth or that idea. So the other thing too I'm interested in is codices, like as we see the Codes Botterini um, and others, um, specifically communication and creativity. Um, how do they communicate and how creative they are about that 
communication and that creativity because as a performer myself, I feel that that's the next level of understanding how do we transfer the information we know to the uh, other people that we want to continue that information to continue to, to be transferred. Uh, so that obviously talks in regards to performative aspects of codices, which we have been exploring lately uh, through my work with uh, Dr. Dr. Paul. And this, of course, I, I couldn't do anything without bringing up Miguel Leon Portilla and this idea of in Cuicatl, in Xochitl, you know, uh, Floricanto, that this idea that rather than just writing a poem or, or, you know, that it is performed, that it is something that is brought to life, because that's what we see in terms of a lot of the Mesoamerican um, daily processes is that it was everything was ceremonial, but everything had a purpose that there was, there was more to it than just a ritual. Um, of course, the cult of death. Um, I last year before we closed down, literally a week before we closed down, um, I went to Guadalajara, uh, and I um, went to make uh, research on the Museo Panteón de Belén, just like my advisor did, and uh, uh, you know, looking at cultural practices and traditions. Um, looking at the cult of death in Mexico and Latin America and how it's exposed in different ways because the way we practice it in Oaxaca is not the same way we practice it in Michoacan. Uh, one of the, um, of the um, interests that I've taken lately that I'm more interested in now is this idea of the, the cult of death or the celebration of death or Dia de Muertos in the Huasteca, the Huasteca, right? Um, because they practice, a, 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 they call it Shantolo, uh, and it's completely different, but it still holds the essence of this celebration of death, which is why I'm eager to go out and research what other, uh, what other cultures, what other cult cultures that are non-Mexica, uh, non, non non-Aztec, how do they practice and how do they compare and where is the connectivity between the two? Of course, music and dance. Um, as you know, I am also a folklorista. I have had the pleasure of leading a beautiful group of dancers for the last uh, 11 years now. Um, the company is called Pasión de Mi Tierra, as it is. Uh, and it is through exploring all of these, all of these different ideas uh, and placing it in a context for students to be able to grasp and present to the world and say, look, it's just more than movement and counting. So performative aspects, of course. Poetry, calaveritas. I've always been a poet. I will always, I probably, I will die as a poet. And this is something that's just my own little, um, little, in, little thing. So what's ahead? Of course, the question everybody needs to answer is research, research, research or, and teach, teach, teach. I really would love to teach uh, starting off in the community colleges. I've worked, I've already taught in elementary and middle and high school. I would like to teach in community college because I feel like that that's where I really got my, all of my hairs in a, in a bun uh, where all of my teachers that were there shaped me so well and they placed me in the right way for me to be able to get to the next level, which was, you know, um, uh, undergrad. And then they placed me in the right nest to be able to get to graduate studies. And I don't, I'm considering the next level. I just need to see where it goes. I, I, I can't promise tomorrow. So my afterthought in all of this, in conclusion to all of my fellow colleagues, because I know that some of my professors are here. And again, I owe you a debt of gratitude to my fellow colleagues. I hope that when you see the stuff that I've gone through, I hope that when you, um, when you can relate, if you can relate, or if you can see that in someone else, I hope that you know that the, the light at the end of the tunnel is real. The light at the end of the tunnel is this beautiful thing called education that will always push us forward and that no matter what happens in your life, they'll never be able to take it away from you. I'm reminded of the great Churchill quote, that success is not final, 
failure is not fatal, but is the courage to continue that counts. So I want to say gracias a todos, my advisors, um, my fairy godmother, my professors, my fellow students, um, my outside family, uh, specifically my students and parents at Pasión de Mi Tierra. Everybody, thank you so much for allowing me to talk and over talk to you today about my little boring life. Gracias. Bravo. Thank you, Gabriel. Bravo, Gabriel. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thank you, Gabe. So inspirational. Um, I have no words, honestly, because it, it's very emotional right now because the, your whole journey is a lot, honestly. Um, but I want to say thank you for sharing your, your journey, your history with us, your tribulations. Um, I can relate to some of that. Um, I was crying earlier because I was like, man, I remember growing up and not having food and on, 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 on the table uh, and deciding what's the best route for me. Um, but yeah, I want to open up the floor for questions. Um, Gabriel here will, will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, but I have, I have so many questions though, but I want to reserve that for, for later though. Um, but I want to open that for any guests. Also, you could write them in the chat or um, if you want to unmute yourself and show the video, you're more than allowed to now, um, whichever you feel most comfortable. It looks like Channing is raising. Yeah, Channing, go ahead. So yes, Channing. hi. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I have a question that I'm still trying to succinctly even put together in my head. Um, but in regards to teaching and going into the field of education, um, I know that right now it feels very uh, strung out in a lot of ways and kind of messy. Um, and especially for those who are undocumented or who do not fit into the mold. So I guess I'm, I'm curious as to see what your teaching path would look like and if you would um, almost be doing anything to influence how your teaching path was and for that of the future, I guess. That's a great question, Channing. Thank you so much. I, I think that that's, that's actually um, something I have to start to consider even more because you know, you're right. There are some, there are some, um, some patterns that, that didn't go like often I would be put in classes where let's say I had to take, you know, astronomy 102 or 101. And uh, from other than taking that specific class, I never had to use it ever. Mind you, of course, now if I get into Mayan, um, uh, hieroglyphics and Mayan studies, and I might need that class. I might need to refresh up on it, right? Uh, but um, I feel that even whether documented or undocumented, I think that what's really important is, is that we start to change some of the ideas about how, where our students should go with what they want. Because I'll give you an example um, that happened at, at, um, at uh, going into undergrad. The first classes were actually core classes that were more like this. These are the kind of genres or the kind of, uh, um, you know, you could do Greek, you could do uh, Roman, you could do Baroque. Um, and the writing process got was one of the last classes I had. And I feel that I would have succeeded more had I had that class at the very beginning, you know, to to like take a writing class, how do I get better at my writing? You know, and how do you expect me to get better at my writing if I'm in the last class of my, in my last semester of my undergrad where I could have taken this class. So I think that there needs to be some kind of restructuring. Um, and I, I wouldn't even say that the, to apply the, the, the label of being documented or undocumented. I think that there, 
are definitely some parameters that can be seen as the same. Uh, and yet I do feel that undocumented students do need that extra support uh, because the stress from being undocumented is no different than being a student with uh, special needs, uh, a student that has autism. Um, you know, if, if a student now gets, let's say an extra hour for when they're taking an exam, perhaps maybe we would do that for uh, somebody who's undocumented because, you know, they might need that extra hour since they're having to clock it, clock out for lunch and have to like, you know, take the test between job number one and job number two. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I have a question from Dr. Richter. Yeah. Hi, that was so, um, such a wonderful, inspirational talk that you gave. And I'm, um, it's kind of amazing that you've made it through all that, right? And it's just like kind of incredible that you've come out of all this, like such a beautiful person who is so positive and passionate and that like you didn't let life cut you down. And I think that is just like, I'm so touched by that because I feel like it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And I feel like, you know, I think this this last year has has taught us how hard that can be and also maybe working from home and all the constraints you might have at home and with the kids and I I over the past year I've thought especially of you know students who maybe don't go home and have you know like a place to work and have you know like a study area and they have to do you know do their homework at the living room kitchen and, you know, like, like squeeze their studies, but in between work or on the bus or things like this. And I think it's, I think you're so absolutely right to emphasize that um, like it's a systemic and societal ill in a way, right? That you have to carry that burden and then there should be accommodations made to help you guys through that, right? Like, because it's not an even playing field, you know? And I was thinking of, you know, the lecture that I just gave and, you know, like the extreme privilege I have, you know, where I could travel. And even if I had to work three jobs, you know, like I had a car um, and like just being able to drive back, even though it was long distances and like to just the ability to get around was so important. So. It's, um, and I, I always had enough food to eat. I had a budget and I was like living with, with a bunch of roommates, but like it's, so in, in, in short, it, it's, it's, really, it's really amazing. So I just wanted like, I, I already admired you. I feel like we had like this, she's me right from the, <laughs> like uh, this like spark right from the beginning. And I, I um, like my adm admiration deepens for you every time we, we speak. But I, I also have a question, and this is something what I sometimes struggle with, um, especially with our undergraduate interns or with students in the past. And I struggle with this idea of sort of the responsibility of putting students on the path to art history when I feel it's a, it's a fraught path, not the study itself. It's a gorgeous discipline, and it's you know like wonderful to be doing this work. But um, I feel like the job prospects are so challenging, and so and I still feel that art history is, you know, it's it's sort of like still seen like it's a job that you do for fun, and it's sort of like expected that you have additional income somehow, or you're independently wealthy because it's really hard to make a good living off of art history if you don't, you know, like if you, especially if you have student debt or if your family isn't wealthy or maybe you don't have like, you know, or you don't have a spouse who can support you. And we have this conversation a lot with, you know, our graduate interns who maybe do have a spouse who like, you know, can support them while they take, um, you know, an internship or something like that. And so I sort of sometimes struggle with, um, students who want to go on this path and then sort of the responsibility of producing students who will potentially end up in a really fraught job market 
And so I would love to hear what you think of that. Like, I, I think passion and love of what you do is so important. And also I worry about, you know, like then having a decent life, you know, where you can support your family and things like this. So I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Yes. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Richter. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. You know, again, um, I knew that I wanted to be an art historian. I just didn't know what I could do with it. And um, I started thinking about, well, what could I do? And somebody mentioned this to me because I had, I, you know, first I forgot to mention that I, I did pay for my associates and my bachelor's without any financial aid. I paid all that cash. I was like, you know, let's, let's just do it out of pocket. Um, I thought, you know, if I live in LA, well, maybe I can get a job as a consultant in a film if they happen to do some kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe I can also be a writer, you know, like a writer and some kind of, you know, whatever. I really didn't even know that there could be other careers besides just being a teacher or a researcher. Um, I didn't know that museum studies were uh, something you could uh, get into. I didn't know that you could do grants. I didn't know that you could work with institutions and bring exhibitions together and create work for uh, creative spaces and galleries and as such. So I think that one of the ideas that really stuck with me was this, well, you're always going to do it because you're passionate about it, but have something else on the side. I think we need to, I think we need to nurture our students a lot more and saying, look, this is what you're going to do. Be good at it what you're whatever whatever it is you choose if you're going to be an art historian who focuses on museum studies and museum practices then be really good at it because jobs are so scarce by the time you get to that you really need to be tip top of that field and what you want if you're going to be a teacher then get the right credentials get the proper um the proper information about where you're going to go because otherwise you're just going to be floating around between one job and another i know Dr. Uh, Professor Rush was talking about she was driving from one college, community college to the other, to the other, to the other, because there aren't that many jobs available. So there definitely needs to be a better infrastructure within the Cal State program and, 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 and the UC program and other universities in terms of gearing our students towards a much more, not for the sake of profit, but a much more, um, um cemented uh future if that makes sense yeah thank you so much thank you gabriel and, and thank you ken for your question i, I have a, a question for you gabriel um as your colleague and and, and, a, and a great friend that you are um how, how now that you've gone through this whole journey like what, what will be your recommendation for someone who is following your footsteps. Like, what we, what can you tell them? Like, what would be your advice for them? Like, this is what you need to do to attain your goals and, and, and dreams. Well, what I would say to them, I would say, that's, that's a hard question to ask me because I would always say, keep going, you know? Uh, never in a million years, Marcos, did I knew, did I think I would be this little kid, you know, that this person who is going to, who is going to uh, get to go places where other people haven't been able to. I'll give you a good example. Um, I meant I never I didn't mention my background, but my family has uh, we're split. My father's side has Washtec uh, background, uh, which is why Dr. Richter and I connect, and then we have the Chichimec connection because my grandmother's from up, upstate uh, San Luis Potosí. So I, I, I connect with from on that side. And, you know, having had those two different cultures in, entwined in me and then living in San Luis Potosí where like there's a Baroque church every other block, um, it, uh, I just, I grew up around it. I grew up, the culture grew in me and outside of me. Um, so I just never, I never thought that I would not do what I do. 
would I encourage somebody to continue this a hundred times over? Yes, I would just, you know, you are, you, you can only be good at what you know, how your heart knows what to do and your heart will tell you. Um, that's the what, that's the reason why my, my dance company is called Pasión de Mi Tierra because uh, Pasión de Mi Tierra, I wanted, I, I was thinking, what do I want this company to reflect? I want it to reflect what I feel to present from my country. You know, I am, I thought I was the most Mexican Mexican, but then I met Dr. Aguilar and it's like, forget it. Um, so, uh, um, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, my, one of my dance mentors, um, her name is um, Miss Karen McDonald. She says, uh, passion has to have purpose. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. So, yeah, I, I would say continue the path, but know how to find the right road and find the right people. Because I didn't have, until I got to Long Beach, uh, until I got to Santa Monica, I really didn't even know where I would go. And luckily I was, uh, you know, uh, I was snoozing around that I found that I talked, I would spend time outside during break instead of like, you know, going to get food or whatever. I would talk to my, my professor, you know, I don't know, Dr. Aguilera still there. She would sit outside and take a break and eat her, you know, her snacks. And I would sit there and talk to her because I thought that was more interesting to me than to try to get a snack. You know, I was like, I wanted to pick her brain. I wanted to know what was going on. And so it was really great to, to be able to get that. But I think it, it has to also come from you. I think it has to come from you. Thank you, Ro. And I'll pass on the, uh, Sada has a question right now, so I'll, I'll let her. So first I wanna just uh, say, Gabriel, just thank you so much for being the person you are. Thank you for being, for speaking with us, for being BIPOC, LGBTQ plus, like, and for just being an amazing person. You've gone through so many tragedies and you, you are a phoenix and you rise up above all of it, um, which I just find so admirable. Even if I didn't see, even if I wasn't your friend, I would think this highly of you because you're just that amazing. So thank you for that. Um, after everything that, like, everything that you've been through with school and just your life in general, if you had a chance to speak to your inner child, what would you tell them to keep going? If I had a chance to speak to little Gabriel, um, mind you, I don't know if you would have liked little Gabrielito because I was quite rambunctious and independent. Um, I can tell you for one, uh, one uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, the town priest called my uh, grandmother because in the morning we were having class and they gave us the, the Ash Wednesday mark. So I thought, oh, he could do it. I could do it. So after class finished, I snuck into the, into the church. I grabbed a, a, a little of aluminum. I grabbed some, um, some of the ashes. And I was dancing around the town, just putting crosses on everybody because I thought that it was like, cool. Um, I also was, my grandmother was always asked to come back to the, uh, um, to the office to talk to the, the, the principal because I was always redecorating the altars in the church and talking to the ladies. I and by it. ladies, I mean the virgins. Um, <laughs> so I think that's always been an innate thing in me to be uh, just intuitive and to be uh, positively assertive to go just to, you know, of course, there are times when I'm going to feel uh, my, I let my heart feel what it feels. But, but ultimately, there's that little light of mine never, never gives up. And I think that that's what I would say to myself is, okay, you know, a lot of really bad stuff's gonna happen to you. Just go for it. Doesn't matter. You'll be fine. Yes, I know. Be, uh, I was definitely <laughs> precocious. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Thank you, Gary Gabriel. Does anyone else have uh, any questions for Gabriel? If not, I'll, I'll 
uh, ask him one more question. Um, um, my question for you, Gabriel, is like, where do you see yourself after post uh, grad school, like uh, in a year or two from now? Uh, yes, that's a really good question. It is an introspective question uh, that I will be looking at in a little bit. Um, I will. There are two factors that I could do, depending on how well I continue with my studies. You know, I mean, I think I'm good, but, you know, Profe has to decide <laughs> if I am good um, uh, pursuing the doctorate degree um, or or another thing that I would want to do is to uh, pursue a, a law degree uh, because I'd want to help uh, anyone that's ever been in the situations that I have been um, and, and help them out, you know, undocumented students, uh, positive students, students who have uh, low, low income, any of those things, I would definitely want to uh, help and be of service to them. Uh, so I, I don't know, the possibilities are endless. Um, I, I have to get another Jalón de Ojeras from someone. And I think that's the person that's asking you for question. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Profe, can you ask a question to Gabriel now? Oh, Profe, you're muted. Profe, you're muted. On mute. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the question I was going to ask, Gabriel, is the question that Marcos did. So uh, you already uh, about your next steps after after the the school, but you already answered as to that. And I just want to tell you that after hearing your story, I have heard, I have known a few parts of this story that you have told me before, but many, I would say the majority, I haven't heard. And really, it's a, it's a journey through uh, uh, everything that can happen in, 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 in the world, you know? Uh, and it's amazing that how you keep your smile and your hum humane personality uh, intact in spite of all those challenges that you experience. And that is something very admirable and very... Uh, impressive for all of us. You you open horizons. You open our views of all of us uh, uh, it, it, be, because it it shows that it's possible always to push harder and to reach our goals if we do with perseverance everything we want. And I will finish because sometimes you are accustomed that I to to, to hear me a lot, so I don't want to overwhelm you <laughs> with speaking too much, but. Uh, I just I, I just would close my 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 comment, uh, saying that at the beginning of classes I have always told uh, my students that to succeed in life you don't need to be in Harvard. You're probably going to re to, re to remember that you don't need to be in Harvard, but you just need to have four qualities to practice four uh, actions. One to believe in yourself. Two, to believe in what you do. Three, to work hard. And four, to develop a spirituality that makes you to always go further because you know there is something else beyond what we see in the physical world. You, you will have something that you that is the light that makes you to live for. No, There is always that something or someone that is uh, beyond. And, and that even gives you a better immune system, gives you a more um, desire to, 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 to fight, no? because you have, you, you, tú tienes, tú tienes a, a, something for whom to live, you know? That is, uh, you have someone to whom to live. That's, so, and I think uh, you are an embodiment of those uh, concepts that I have always uh, mentioned, you know, so I, every time I, 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 I meet my students, I tell them, no matter where we are, we need to do our best. We could be in the best or the worst university in the world, but it is us who are making a difference, you know, not the place. So then I think you are the embodiment of all that. And I am very happy to, 
to, to find the, uh, someone who can show us the way, because it's not so easy to find someone that reaches a point of, their, of his or her dreams and can stay and keep going. So congratulations, Gabriel, and thank you for your testimony that was very powerful. Thank you. Gracias, Profe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? I had a question in the chat. Um, we typically ask this at the end, um, but since we didn't have any, uh, Gabriel, what does art history mean to you? Like, <laughs> I know it's a art hard. history means uh, art history means to me never having to look at another math problem again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, um, art history means to me that you combine um, two elements and create a plethora of uh, of uh, colors, and every single one of those colors is a different genre, style, look, medium, uh, idea, feeling, all of them. I don't know, I, I hate to sound biased, but I don't know any other, I don't know any other, any other teach, uh, teaching that, that does that, like art history does. We have to be scientists, we have to be archeologists, anthropologists, doctors, uh, weather forecasters, we have to be uh, party planners. We have to be everything because every single thing we study requires looking at it from so many different ways and finding how to how to relate it to the context that we're in. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I would consider that. Es un jarabe. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, with that being said. Um, I, on behalf of the Art History Society, thank you for coming out to support us in the arts. I would like also to thank our officers here today, Sara, um, of course, Gabriel, who presented today, um, Gabriela uh, Channing here, who was earlier, um, Alec also, who's also in this uh, meeting with us, and all the members of EHS. Um, um, without you guys, we, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, our organization, organization is dedicated to community involvement in the arts and giving opportunities to everyone. We can to, we, we can to learn, understand, and pursue the arts. Um, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more events and information on our upcoming guest speakers that will be speaking on May uh, 6 at 6 p.m. Um, if you like us, if you'd like to support us or hear more about our, our upcoming events, uh, check out our links in the chat. Um, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, we have a AHS website and a Facebook account. Um, and thank you all for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Hi, thank everyone. You. Hi to you, Gabriel. Say hello. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, bye -bye. thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Dr. Elizabeth. Gabriel Marcos, did you want to?